Welcome to Back to the Bible Radio, featuring best-selling author and internationally known Bible teacher Warren Wearsby. In the closing verses of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul emphasizes four spiritual priorities. And uh, these priorities are important for us individually and also collectively as a local church, whatever church you may be in. Verse 25 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, what are these priorities? Well, prayer, verse 25. Christian love, verse 26. The word of God, verse 27. And the grace of God, verse 28. If we will make these our priorities, then God will be able to do something in our lives and in our local churches. Let's start with prayer in verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. Prayer is a priority in the Christian life and in the local church. So many churches don't do this anymore. We have plenty of time for announcements. We have plenty of time for special music, but we don't have time for prayer. And we need to take time for prayer. Now, not just on Sunday mornings, but other times as well. The local church needs prayer. You see, the church was born in a prayer meeting. In Acts chapter 1, you'll find that the believers were in a prayer meeting. I take it that's what they were doing when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. They were in a prayer meeting, crying out to God and asking him to fulfill his purposes. The church expanded through prayer. That marvelous prayer in Acts chapter 4, when the apostles came back from being arrested, and they cried out to God and said, Oh, God, you are Lord. Now bear your arm and glorify your name. The church expanded through prayer. And the church got victory through prayer. Now, prayer is not only important to the church, it's important to the individual believer. The Apostle Paul started his Christian life with prayer. In Acts chapter 9, God said, Behold, he's praying. In chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, Night and day praying exceedingly. Now, there's a statement for you, not just praying, but praying in the daytime, praying in the nighttime, and praying exceedingly. I wonder if I pray like that. Paul did. Prayer is important to the Christian life. Now, when they prayed for Paul, they were praying for someone who was strategically involved in the ministry of the gospel. They were praying for one whom God was using in a wonderful way. Do you pray for Christian leaders? But it's easy to criticize them, easy to find fault with them, but when it comes to praying for them, that's something else. Oh, how you need to pray for your pastor and for the elders of the church and for the ministry of your denomination and for those who are in leadership. Pray. That's priority number one. Now, priority number two is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 26, Christian love. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. May I remind you that in that time, in that culture, the men greeted the men and the women greeted the women. You did not have the men throwing their arms around the women and kissing them. Paul's not talking about something romantic here. He's talking about something very sacred. In fact, Peter calls it a, uh, a holy kiss, a kiss of love. Uh, greet one another with a holy kiss, with a kiss of love. I suppose we would say, shake hands all around. That's the way Phillips translates it in uh, one of the editions of his paraphrase. Christian love. What he's talking about here is love of the brethren. Oh, how important this is. We know we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. 1 John 3, 14. Jesus said in the upper room before he went off to the cross, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, as I have loved you, there's the measure of it, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
Now, in those two short verses, he emphasizes the meaning and the importance of Christian love. Now, all that verse 26 implies is, number one, we assemble together. You can't greet each other unless you're there. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together because the day is approaching. It means we assemble together. It means that we know each other. We greet each other. We encourage each other. We show love to each other. Christian love. Paul prayed that their love might increase. Remember that? Chapter 3, verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. There's that river overflowing again. Well, God answered that prayer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Oh, do you pray for more love? Do you pray that the river of love in your heart might overflow and just touch more people? Christian love. Now, the third priority is given to us in verse 27. That's God's word. I charge you, and that's one of the strongest words he could have used. I adjure you. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. He's talking here about the public reading of the word of God. Now, allow me to say this. Not only are we neglecting pastoral praying in our church services, we are neglecting the public reading of the Word of God. In many churches, the only scripture you hear read is the short text that the pastor is using for his sermon. Now, Paul said, I'm charging you that the scriptures be read publicly in your assembly. I think we ought to get back to that. The Thessalonians had a marvelous relationship to the Word of God. They had received the Word of God in much affliction and joy of the Holy Spirit. They appreciated God's Word. Paul said, I thank the Lord that you don't receive the Word of God like the Word of men, chapter 2, verse 13. You receive it as it really is in truth, the Word of God. They were sharing the Word of God. Finally, verse 28, Priority number four, the grace of God. All of this depends upon God's grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, this was Paul's signature in his letters. If you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you'll find Paul saying an interesting thing about his signature. I once received a letter from a, a listener who complained about my signature, and I wrote back and said, I don't blame you for complaining about it. But it, right now, it's the best I can do. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. And here it is in verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Paul often dictated his letters, and when the letter was completed, he would read it, and then he would add with his own signature so they would know that the letter was not a forgery. Apparently, somebody had tried to uh, get a forgery into the church in Thessalonica. Uh, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians tells us about that in verse 2 not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. Somebody had forged a letter. Paul said, you can always tell that I wrote the letter. Here's my signature, and I always tie into it the grace of God. Now think about that. The word of God is the word of his grace, Acts 20, 32. When you minister the word of God, you're ministering God's grace. The throne of God is a throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. So when you pray, you are coming to God, access to the throne of grace to get the grace of God. 1 Peter 5, 10 tells me that our God is the God of all grace. Now, there's more than one kind of grace. Are there saving grace, for by grace are you saved through faith? There's suffering grace, my grace is sufficient for you. There is singing grace, singing with grace in your hearts. Uh, there is speaking grace, 
Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. As you go through the Word of God, you find all kinds of grace. Our God is the God of all grace. So when you come to the Word of His grace and to the throne of grace, you come to the God of all grace, about whom James says He gives more grace, and more, and more, and more, James 4, 16. And the last word in this letter is amen. Now, can you say amen to these priorities? Paul did. Prayer, Christian love, the word of God, the grace of God. Oh, from our hearts there needs to arise a holy amen. As we review 1 Thessalonians, let's look at chapter 1 now. These people's lives had been transformed. Verse 9, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. So many people who profess to be Christians have had no transformation in their lives. My Bible tells me that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Well, they were an elect people. Secondly, they were an exemplary people. Verses 6 and 7, you became followers of us and of the Lord. Verse 7, you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Oh, how we need to be an exemplary people, receiving the word of God, becoming imitators of the Lord, becoming examples for others to follow. They were an enthusiastic people. Verse 8, Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Enthusiastically, they were sounding forth the word of God. They were winning people to Christ in Thessalonica and in Achaia and in Macedonia and wherever the word of God went, there they were sharing the message of the gospel. An elect people, an exemplary people, an enthusiastic people, and finally an expectant people to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, looking for the Lord to come again. No man knows the day or the hour. It might be today. We'd better be ready. Chapter 2 Paul looks back and remembers how the church was nurtured. Now we have Paul the pastor, and Paul pictures himself in uh, several different ways here. He starts off as the athlete. Uh, Verse 2 of chapter 2, We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now that word conflict is the translation of the Greek word that gives us our word agony or agonize. It's a picture of of the runner, the athlete, running in the race, just agonizing, striving, enduring that he might reach the goal. Paul said when we left Philippi, it would have been easy to quit. Paul said we need the toughness of the athlete. But don't stop there. In verses 3 through 6, he compares himself to a steward. For our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, nor was it in guile, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. The trustworthiness of the steward. Paul's message was right. Our exhortation did not come from deceit. That means error. He had the right message, and he had the right motive His motive was right, and his method was right, nor was it in guile. Paul was a faithful steward, and those of us who minister the Word of God had better be faithful, because that's what God's looking at. It is required among stewards that a man be found faithful, not necessarily popular, not necessarily successful in the eyes of men, but faithful to the Lord. Thirdly, he was a loving parent. In verse 7, he was gentle as a nursing mother. And down in verse 11, he comforted and exhorted and encouraged them, charged them, implored them as a father. He, He was ministering to them as a spiritual parent. That is a tough job. Paul had time for individuals. I appreciate the burden he had. He nurtured them. He nurtured them as a brother 
who loved them. Verse 17, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you. The Greek word means orphaned, bereaved. He said, I feel like an orphan separated from my family. I was to you a father and a mother, but now that I'm separated from you, Paul was driven out of town, was not allowed to come back. Paul said, I feel like an orphan out here. And then he had to send Timothy back to encourage them. So he remembers chapter 1, how the church was born. He remembers chapter 2, how the church was nurtured. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your spiritual leaders. It is a tough job to be faithful in spiritual ministry. And oh, how we need it today to watch for souls, to take time to comfort people personally, to exhort them personally, to implore them personally. Oh, that takes time, takes energy. Chapter 3, he remembered how the church was stabilized. The key word here is stand, establish. Verse 2, we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, get you on your feet. Why? Because in chapters 4 and 5, they have to walk. The church is born in chapter 1, nurtured in chapter 2, stabilized in chapter 3, so it can walk in chapters 4 and 5. Well, he looks back at the work described in chapter 3. He said, I couldn't go back, so I sent Timothy. There's the ministry of our presence. Timothy just being there was an encouragement to the people. He shared the word of God with them. He'd go back and take this letter. And Paul prayed for them. Here are three ways we can help people stand. We can go to them, the ministry of our presence. We can share the word of God with them, and we can pray for them. Now in chapters 4 and 5, we have a second focus. He looks within and he admonishes them. He could see the problems they were facing. And the emphasis here is on their walk. Verse 1, walk and please God. How do you do that? by obeying the commandments that have been given through the Lord Jesus. The word commandments in verse 2 means a military order handed down from an officer. Paul looked upon the church as a family, but he also looked upon the church as an army. And here he says, I've got some commandments for you. And if you want to walk straight and walk right and be in step, then you will obey these commandments. He describes here a fourfold walk. First, he tells us to walk in purity. Verses 1 through 8, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. God commands it. The Word of God demands it. We should learn how to possess our own bodies in sanctification and honor. God did not call us to uncleanness. He called us in holiness. Walk in purity, walk in love, verses 9 through 12. Brotherly love, a love for God, a love for our brethren in our fellowship, and then let that love spread out. Verse 10, he says, all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and then love those outside the fellowship. Well, love, walking in love, walking in hope chapter 4, verse 13, through chapter 5, verse 11. The day of the Lord means comfort and blessing and victory for the saved, and it means uh, judgment and sorrow and agony for the lost. And he exhorts us to be alert, to be awake, and to look for the coming of the Lord. He closes the uh, chapter by telling us to walk in harmony a series of exhortation. He exhorts the leaders, and then he exhorts the people. Now you love your leaders, and you follow them as they follow the Lord. That's one of the best ways to have peace in the church. Follow the leaders and be sure that they follow the Lord. And then he has a series of exhortations to the problem people in the church, the unruly, the faint-hearted, the weak. Then he talks about our relationship to everyone. Be patient, Don't pay people back, no retaliation, and remember, you should pursue what is good. He closes with our relationship to the Lord. In 18, rejoice, pray, give thanks. 
Be joyful, be prayerful, be thankful. That's your inward relationship to the Lord. And then 19 through 21, our public worship of the Lord. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things. Don't be afraid of what the Holy Spirit may have to say to you. And finally, he closes with this great prayer benediction of sanctification. Now, his third focus is on the coming of the Lord. And then he looks up and he rejoices. He says, Jesus is coming again. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the coming of our Lord. And it's important that we see this. In chapter 1, verse 10, he connects the coming of our Lord with salvation. These people had turned to God from idols. They were serving the living and true God and therefore were waiting for his Son. In chapter 2, he connects the coming of our Lord with service. Verses 19 and 20. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Your, your job may be tough today. You may be having a rough time today. But when Jesus comes, all that toil will be turned into joy. All that sacrifice and suffering will be turned into glory. Chapter 3, he connects the coming of our Lord with stability, verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless. Chapter 4, he connects the coming of our Lord with sorrow, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. We do have hope. We are going to see the Lord. We are going to see our loved ones. We are going to be caught up to be with the Lord and the saints in the clouds and we are forever to be with the Lord. Therefore, don't sorrow as though you have no hope. Chapter 5, he closes the chapter and the book by connecting the coming of the Lord with sanctity. The God of peace sanctify you that you might be blameless at the coming of our Lord. And that's what we're looking for today. Lift up your hearts. Your redemption is drawing near. We're glad you joined us today. If you missed part of the program or you'd like to listen again, just come to backtothebible.org. So be sure to come back again for more wisdom from God's Word. Back to the Bible, leading you forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.